uh, keep you from asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot, uh, I cannot see your faces, so we want to be there. All right, very good. Well, welcome to uh, to Foundations. Um, and do you have any a chance to meet? Did you meet? Uh, just no, I'm here to see. Nice to meet you. I'm Kristen. I'm Kristen. Sorry, Kristen. Kristen. Oh, you're Hi. Right. No, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> up there. Yeah, so. Hi, Kristen. 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 And Tracy, yeah, Tracy. Hi, how are you? Right. See, their kids are older. Okay. So Justine's in fourth grade. Yes. Grayson's in seventh, and Colt's in seventh. Seven. Mm -hmm. And Carrie is um, D.D. Messner, Donovan's mom, is your aunt. Oh, nice. Okay. She's yeah. Yeah. We love her. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and Justine keeps us. Yeah. Very good. <clears throat> okay. Um, Welcome. And uh, these binders uh, that I gave you, um, we're going to be adding on to it each week. You see there's six different sessions, and I'll be handing out one at a time. Uh, and the way I like to do a class like this, I need a little fill-in to fill in. Um, I just I, I like to do it that way. Kind of engages our brain, makes, it, makes us write it down. Uh, I will also... Um, send out to you um, a copy of the, the slides if you want to go back and review any of that. Um, so we can do that. Now, the let's let's begin the prayer before I go on. Lord Jesus, thank you for your gifts to us, your grace to us, and your love for us. Uh, we thank you for this chance to spend some time learning more about you and about your word, and pray your blessing on each one of us here. And this, this time to go. In Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. If I hand this around, mm -hmm. I might have the information, but anyway, just write it out. The name is the best way to contact my cell phone, and that purpose of that is if for some reason I'm going to make a change in the class, you know, cancel move or whatever, I can get a hold of you like now. So, that would be helpful. Okay, I, I like. Teaching this class, I love teaching this class. It's my favorite class to teach because I, I love the Christian faith um, because of the hope and the joy and the comfort that it gives. And also, um, there's a beauty to it that I, I really appreciate. Um, just given my own spiritual journey, I'm not going to go into all the big long story of taking this. Class, but I was raised uh, Roman Catholic, uh, actually in a mixed home. My dad was Roman Catholic, very devout, very involved in the parish. She was choir director and all kinds of things. My mom was a very pious Southern Baptist. Okay, how's that? <laughs> they were married in the 50s, 1954, so she had to sign uh, not interference not to be involved in a religious upbringing, so I was raised Roman Catholic. Um, and in a, very, in a very Christian home, very Christian home. They worked it out well, except ways on Sunday morning, we prayed together, and it was all good. But my own journey through high school and into college, was a lot of questioning, a lot of, a lot of things that I learned that I challenged, especially on authority, and where does this truth thing come from? And that led me once I got away to college, like you know, a lot of folks leave their faith behind them sometimes when they go to college. I did that, but I didn't leave the quest behind. And during that time, I was dabbling in and reading and exploring everything else. Buddhism, Islam, Shintoism, Hinduism, um, Objectivist philosophy is just, I just had this, this insatiable desire to know the truth and keep me searching for it. And I kept coming up with, with okay, that's nice, that's your opinion. Um, let's see what else is out there. Uh, until, um, just a, a compressed story. In my um, last year of college, I decided to give Christianity a try again. And went back to uh, the Catholic Church. But not long after that, started having some 
issues again with a few key, key points. I respect a whole bunch of it, and we're going to point out some of the different emphases as we go through this. I respect a whole bunch, but there's a couple of things that are really bugging me. And, um, and some of it centers on what we'll talk about tonight and the, the free grace of God. And it was at you know, that time that discussing this with a friend of mine, um, you know, she pointed out that my issue was trying to reconcile myself to God. I went on the spiritual search, the spiritual quest to reconcile myself to God. And she said, well, she said nicely, but kind of like, well, dummy, you know, you don't reconcile yourself to God. He's reconciling himself to you. That's what the cross is. That's the gospel. We don't climb to God. God comes to us. And there's a beauty in that. And understanding that can make everything clear. And all the searching came to an end. And so I really appreciate that friend for helping me understand that. I appreciate it so much. I married her. So, you know, that's <laughs> a so, uh, good deal. There's more to the story. Maybe some more that I'll um, tell later on. But, um, but it, it makes me really appreciate the truth of, of the gospel. So what's this class about? The goal of prayer is that you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ as you grow in knowledge of Him and what it means to be in this relationship and in your ability to share this good news with others. So relationships is the big kind of the overall paradigm we're going to be uh, going through. So the overview of tonight, we're going to be talking about a saving relationship. That our relationship, relationship with God is about salvation. Next week, a divine relationship. We'll focus on God as God has revealed Himself. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What does that mean? The next week, a conversational relationship. Communicating with God. We'll study what we mean when we talk about the Bible being God's Word. And we'll talk about what prayer is all about. So that two-way communication. The next week is a sacred relationship. We'll talk about uh, connecting with God through sacraments, baptism, the Lord's Supper. And uh, then the next one, a living relationship, how we live out the relationship. And that we'll be talking about the Ten Commandments and as a summary of what it means to live out the faith. And then finally, a communal relationship, a community. And we'll be looking at what it means to be in relationship with, with other people in a congregation. So it's all about relationships. So, oh, before we get to that, advertisement for you. Okay. Does anybody have this app or get this app? I do. I did on my old phone okay. before I lost it. But I did. I did have that. Well, I would really encourage you uh, to, if you don't, if you don't have it, to, to, to get it. It's on the App Store, it's on Google Play. It's a Bible. U Version Bible. Uh, you can search Bible, or you can search U Version. It'll look like this. And what it is, it's when you have a Bible on your phone, wherever you go, and it is in all the different versions. Pick which one you want. If you want to read the Bible in French, you can do that too. Or Iranian, or you know, Farsi, or whatever. It's all there. It'll even read to you. You don't want to hear what it sounds like, so you can read the Bible to you in French. And but also some of the really neat has a number of other features, like it'll send you a verse a day if you want that. Well, there's always been a Bible reading plan. So we really want to encourage, encourage that. Um, and uh, I'm gonna be sharing some other apps and websites as we go through this, but that's a, a real fundamental. Okay, relationships. As I already mentioned, that's kind of our paradigm for going through this, relationships. God made you, made me for relationships. We are not intended to be hermits. This is not to say that if you're an introvert, there's something wrong with you. But we are made for relationships. Uh, we're going to touch on this next week when we talk about God. That is part of reflecting God. God, as we can see him in the Christian faith, is a relationship. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is singular. So 
we are made for a relationship with other people. We're made for a relationship with creation, with the world around us. And we're made for a relationship with God. Now, God wants all people to be in relationship with Him. And the real, the key phrase, um, way we describe this is to be in relationship with Him is by grace through faith. You'll hear that expression uh, quite a bit. By grace through faith. Now, when we use the word grace, that word is used in a lot of different ways. You can refer to somebody's smooth movements. You know, they move gracefully. Um, or their kindness as somebody acting with a lot of grace. Uh, but how we use it here, biblically, it means gift. When we talk about grace, it means gift. So God, the relationship with God is to be a gift through faith. And we'll talk a little about what that means. And here's a few key verses. The um, most well-known Bible verse, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, grace, here it is, gave through faith. Whoever believes. Okay, right there. In that most famous of verses. John 14, verses 2 to 3. This is a conversation from a conversation Jesus was having with his disciples at the Last Supper. And he's preparing them for his departure. And he says, My father's house is being rooms. So if that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take me with me, that you also may be where I am. There he's speaking about this God's desire that we be with him forever. He wants a relationship that's eternal. And that's it's a key thing about this relationship thing, is that what God intends is for all people to be in relationship with him, but also that that relationship is eternal. It's forever. Okay. All right. I do want to point out also, anywhere along the line as we're talking, if we've got questions, so this is clear, or this will make a point, go right ahead. Um, but uh, I'll stop occasionally and see if there's questions that you have. Now let's talk about these relationships. Perfect relationships. What would, let's just imagine a little bit, what would our world be like? If all relationships were perfect, let's just talk about with people. What would it be like if all relationships with people were perfect? Boring. What's that? Boring. Boring. <laughs> there would be no conflict. No conflict. Yeah. Well, you think, you know, like you said, this thing will hold on to our energy is because. There we go, misunderstanding. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 There would be no wars. There would be no fighting. There would be harmony. There would be peace. Okay. There wouldn't be politicians yelling at each other. There would be peace. Okay? What if we had a perfect relationship with creation? You'd be caring for it, right? Expecting the Expecting the environment. You didn't respect us. You wouldn't be trying to blow us away or, or shake us or burn us. Okay. Relationship with self. What would it be like if all our relationships with ourselves? Peace, contentment, health. Relationship with God. So, well, what is what is our world really like? Are relationships perfect? No, of course not. But we can imagine a more perfect world. Hunger points to food. Thirst points to water. Loneliness points to love. 
So what does it mean that we ache for a better world, a better existence, a better life? What are we aching for? I mean, this is something we can imagine that we long for, a world where there isn't death, there is not disease, there's not war, there's not conflict, there's not danger. See, we ache for a better world. We know there's something wrong in this world. It's not working the way we can imagine it and the way we'd like it to. Uh, there's danger, there's hardship, there's pain, and there's loss. Did one once exist? The world someday? Yes. Yes. Talk about relations. That's where I want to talk about. Start off. We can imagine current relationships, but we also we have to imagine them because we don't have them. We don't have perfect. But God's intent was to create perfect relationships. He created a wonderful world, and in the beginning, all the relationships were right. Now, um, you see on your Hand out here. Did I put this on the screen? No, I didn't. Okay. The little picture there. Okay. See the one on the right, the left, I mean, it says designed for good. See the little, two little stick people? Isn't that great? Art, art okay. They're close together. That's signifying relationships between people. Really good. And then the circle around them, that's the world. Nice smooth line. Okay. Signifying relationship with the world. It's very good. And then the big line, circle around it, relationship with God. Nice smooth line, everything is good. God made, God intended, God created, we'll talk about that next week. That was the intent. Perfect relationships. Okay? That, a perfect relationship with creation. Creation was designed to provide for us we were designed to care for creation in an interdependent relationship. Uh, let's see where I put it. Hmm. I'll expect it. Okay. Well, I'll use, okay. I will use my Bible. Genesis 1, 29 to 31. I didn't bring, bring Bibles, uh, extra Bibles. That's why you have to come. Um, but uh, I'll just read it a little bit. Oops, hold on just a second. This is in the account of a creation, God speaking to the first people and saying, And God said, I give you every seed bearing plant in the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with the seed in it, they'll be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds in the sky, and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he made, and it was very good. There was the evening, and there was the morning, the sixth day. The point is, God, God is describing his creation and humanity in perfect harmony. The second verse there, we're not going to look that up, that's the account of, of Adam and the garden uh, naming the animals, uh, caring for them. So there's this perfect, idyllic creation. People. People were designed to take care of each other. They are made to be in true community, to love and be loved, to serve and to be served, to be themselves without shame in front of each other. In, front of each other. in chapter 2 of Genesis describes the creation of woman. Uh, the account says it's not good for the man to be alone, so woman was created. And when Adam saw her, he said, this is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman. That statement 
from, from uh, God before the creation of woman, it's not good for the man to be alone. We're not meant to be alone. We're meant to be in, in a relationship. So people were designed to help each other, to care for each other. And then to be in relationship with God. Uh, it's pretty, pretty clear we look at those verses as well, but we're not going to right now. Okay, that was God's intent. That's what he wanted, but something went wrong. Next page. Oh, there's the next one. Okay. With God completely in charge, we had a wonderful world, but God created humanity with the ability to choose. The ability to choose is a good thing. But whenever there is the ability to choose, that means there will also be the ability to choose poorly. Uh, to choose whether to live in the relationship that he has created for us. And humanity chose self over the relationship with God. And I've been making that choice ever since. Now choosing self over a relationship with God is what the Bible calls sin. Sin. Sin is essentially a pride thing of saying... I want what I want, not what you want, God. We want to be in charge. And that's what happens in Genesis 3. And the familiar account of a serpent. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, but only good and evil. So she's being deceived. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and ate it. And the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Okay. They had disobeyed God. They had chosen something for themselves instead of what God wanted for them. Then there's consequences. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They hid from the Lord among the trees. The Lord God called the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid it. Okay, there's that relationship with God is, is no longer perfect. He's hiding from God instead of being open with God. And he, God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree in the garden I told you not to eat from? And the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Okay, what did he do there? What did he blame? He blamed Eve and God. The, the woman you gave me, I am the innocent victim. So there's the relationship with her as well. So this one um, sin is breaking things up. And then the woman uh, blames the serpent and so forth. And then God says to the serpent, cursed are you about the livestock, and he curse the serpent. And later on to the, uh, to the man and the woman, he speaks about the consequences uh, in relationships and in working the ground and so forth. So, what happened here is because of the disobedience with God and the breaking of that relationship, it, it broke everything. It's like a wrecking ball hits the cosmos. And so the relationship between Adam and Eve is broken. Relationships amongst people. The relationship with creation is broken. Now, as God tells Adam, he will have to, by the sweat of his brow, uh, work the soil. So, creation, 
The relationship of interdependence is damaged. Creation is now also difficult, dangerous, and deadly. Humanity now damages creation. People now damage and hurt each other. Now we see our own desires first, even when others are hurt. There are societal ills, such as racism, sexism, slavery, corruption, injustice, and corruption. And then I'm going to cite there Genesis 4, which is the account of Adam and Eve's sons, the one who kills the other, Cain and Abel. And now we damage our relationship with God. We tend to ignore God and live for ourselves. We quote, no good and evil by choosing for ourselves what is good and evil, instead of only pursuing what God has defined as good. And this is sin. You see the situation. Any, any question? Okay. God intended everything for good. Something very bad happened. Now everything is wrecked. Right. So here our circle is all messed up. Now, little stick people are, are apart. Okay? With this crackly line between them. Squiggly lined out, it's not lined out, the line signifying relationship with creation. That's messed up. Relationship with God, that line's messed up. And the arrows are pointing in sin is pride and self centered, centered in. So a little graph depicting how things are wrecked. Okay. Alright. Our world then is a place of damaged relationships. It's still a very good world, but it's damaged. These damaged relationships are bad and cause much hurt, pain, and loss, and suffering in our world. But the damaged relationship with God is more severe because it's eternal. To be cut off from God is to be cut off from life. Our damaged relationship with God keeps us from permanently and effectively repairing the other relationships. The damaged relationship is a condition we call sinful nature. It's like I said before, it's like when sin comes in, it's like a wrecking ball hits everything. And now humanity, we got a problem. We don't have to learn how to be selfish. We have to learn how to not be. So we are, we are damaged from what we are designed to be. We are self-centered rather than God-centered. This is a really key thing. But think about this. Sin is not just something we do, but also our fallen condition. That is a really key point. That, that there's something, there's something wrong. If the problem was just that we do wrong things, the answer would just be to stop doing them. The thing is, though, we can't try to be perfect. Try to live a day God-centered and always being perfect in our relationships. It doesn't work. You can't do it. A few verses here. Now, we get to this next section here, stop on page 6. Uh, now I have all the verses printed out. Um, and I'd like to do, so I can rest my voice, is just go around and read, read the verses. Plus, if you don't want to read, just say, pass. So, Tracy. Psalm 51.5 Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Okay, this is a psalm of David. Um, David was a great king of the Old Testament, but he was a fallen person. He um, sinned by uh, committing adultery with another man's wife, and then he arranged, arranged for her husband to be killed. Pretty bad. And this is his psalm of repentance. So he's reflecting that sin is not just that he did this, but I've been sinning my own life. Okay. And Paul, in the flood of the Romans, reflects on this. Go ahead, Tom. Consequently, I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. 
consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. Through that one sin, we're all infected. It's like something <coughs> spiritually genetic. Okay? We're all infected. It's like one player steps over the line, the whole team is called off sides. Okay? Uh, that's what Paul's getting at here. So it's important to keep this in mind. We sin because of our sinful condition. And because we sin, we fall short of the good we're designed for. Okay. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. Okay, John is just reflecting on this truth that, hey, I've got to be honest, we're not perfect. In Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All things we declare this covers, this covers of Can we fix a solution? Can we attain the righteousness we are designed for? Can we repair the relationship with God? Okay. This is where religion as a human institution comes in. Religion as a human institution is humanity's attempt to repair the relationship. Okay, I should have Led Zeppelin going for that. Right? <laughs> Stay with you. Um, different religions have different means of climbing the ladder. But this is a human institution what religion is about. Um, that we have a problem. That is, that is something that is in all of the world's religions and all of the philosophies that are even secular. There's a problem. We don't live as we know we should. What is the problem? You know, whether it's in Hinduism or Buddhism, Islam, Shintoism, there's, well, there's a problem that we have. There's a condition that we are falling short of, and then there's a goal to be attained. And so it's pictured as, we bring a picture as climbing the stairway to attain it. And there's different means of climbing the stairway. Good deeds, okay, that if you are good enough, you climb up there through your kindness, your charity, your giving of yourself. Uh, meditation, attaining the proper um, and, and the proper self-effacing, self-emptying meditation. You find that in Buddhism and some other types of Hinduism. The performance of the right rituals. In some religions, performing all, going through all the right ceremonies, performing all them correctly. That's how you do it. For others, it's prayer. And if you pray the right way, keep praying, keep praying. That's how you climb. For some, it's, it's suffering. That my suffering and hardship in life is actually me climbing the ladder. And um, for some, martyrdom, uh, which was a big factor in what happened 18 years ago today. That those men who hijacked the planes did what they did because they, you know, because of their hatred for friends, but they saw this as their way to climb the ladder. Well, this is not how, this is not Christianity. Um, this is not something that can be done. The Bible says we cannot climb the stairway and so restore our right relationship with God. It cannot be done. The mountain was too high. The gap was too far across. God is so far beyond us. Romans 3.20 
Oops, I skipped Romans 3.20. There it is. Okay. I guess it's interesting. Okay. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law of God. Because through the law, the unconscious of sin. We need an answer. All humanity needs an answer. All creation needs an answer. Okay. So we haven't had much good news yet in class. So I'm going down here. I'm going down here. Okay. Now I've got to turn this turn. You know, there's a, a reason why the gospels, what well, gospel means good news. It's good news because there's a problem. If it wasn't a problem, it would be good news. If there wasn't a problem, that's what we're talking about. God would not have had to come and die. But there's a problem that can only be solved that way. So this is why Jesus came. This is what Christmas is all about. It's what Good Friday and Easter are all about. It's what Christianity is all about. Christianity is not about climbing the stairway to heaven. Now sometimes it's thought of that way. And there are well many Christians who think of their faith that way. That is not the Christianity of the Bible. Christianity is about God coming down to take us to Himself. Christianity is about a restored relationship with Jesus, who is the stairway to heaven. He's the stairway. He is the way. So, Christianity, biblical Christianity, turns this whole thing on its head of what is is commonly thought of as religion. It's not about us. It's not what we do. It's what God has done. So Genesis 28, 12, we're back around to you, Tracy. Jacob have a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth, with its top reaching the heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Okay. There's the stairway. Okay. Then John 51, 51 goes with it. Jesus then added, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Okay, Jesus is the bridge. He's the stairway. He is the connection between God and humanity. Now when I talk about other faiths like I was just talking about, I don't mean to mean. Um, there, there are good things in all of them. There's good things that are special about ethics in all of them. Uh, but there's also a deficiency, something missing. And what's missing is this, that, that we cannot ever attain it ourselves, but God gives it to us. That's what makes the good news. That's what Christianity is unique. Biblical Christianity is unique amongst the world religions in that it is, its center is not what we do, but what God has done. It's about an event. It's not a philosophy. Buddhism is a philosophy. Hinduism is also is a stories and method of meditation. Islam is an ethic and a philosophy. Christianity is about events that God did. It's about things that happen. And without the things that happen, there's no Christianity. Jesus also taught that when he was talking about what a living relationship is key, is what he did. Factually, what he did. So, there's some just illustrating what I was talking about. There's a gap between humanity and God and Jesus is the bridge. Jesus did. Okay. Why did Jesus come? To bring us back into relationship with Him, to restore a right relationship with Him. That's called salvation. He came to bring it about. There's other things we can say about it. To give us the entrance into the place of perfect relationships, the new creation. You hear us talking about that on, on Sundays. We like to use that expression more than saying, dying and going to heaven. That isn't necessarily the most helpful biblical way of saying it. There's a new creation in the resurrection. 
of perfect relationships. We cannot begin to imagine what that will be like, but it's what God initially designed us for. Um, Jesus came to give us that new creation. The old creation is wrecked, but God's intent is not to give up on it, but to resurrect it. Uh, as we're going to talk about, the hope of Christianity is our resurrection. Well, it's not just for people. The whole creation is going to be resurrected. So, that is what he came for. He also came to empower us to be his agents in restoring relationships in the world. Okay, now we're getting into our ethic. That's why we live the way we do. Following Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's, it's much bigger than saying Jesus Jesus died, so when I die, I go to heaven. It's not bigger than that. He died to give me salvation, to restore all of creation, but also to call me to be his agent in giving evidence of what he's done by restoring relationships in my life now. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So it's not just for humanity, it's for all of creation. Okay, here's our picture now. Okay, now we got the people are close together again with the cross. Jesus came down, there's the cross. And now we're restoring relationship with God, but there's still a messed up relationship. I said that was before. This is the world. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, this relationship is by grace through faith. Here's that expression again. Okay, by grace through faith. while we were still undeserving, we weren't even on the stairway at all, going down instead of coming up. Christ died for us. That is grace, the gift of God. So our relationship <coughs> is restored by grace through faith. This is so freeing. It's a, you know, it gives peace. I don't have to prove myself to God. I don't have to earn. And it's not because God is like just a kindly old grandfather who says, no, oh, whatever you did, it's okay. No, there was a problem that needed to be dealt with. The problem was so bad, Jesus had to die. So, I can say it this way. I, I was so bad that Jesus had to die and forgive me, but I am so loved, he was glad to do it. That's the gospel. Grace can be looked at as an acronym. G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches, forgiveness, grace, new creation, all that. But at Christ's expense, it's not me, I'm not earning it. Okay. Any questions, comments? I need to cook your wine. So what did Jesus do to, let's just look a little more closely into, into Jesus, what he was doing. That's Rembrandt's Jesus. So what did he do? He lived. Okay? First thing he did is he lived. His life pictured the perfectly restored relationship. It's like his life showed up and we had a picture of what life was supposed to be like before the fall. He displayed a perfectly restored relation with the Father. I and the Father are one. Oops, I'm ready. Oh, I'm ready. I'm sorry. Just wait for us. That's yours. I got to carry it. You can do the next one. John 5, 18. 
Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth. The Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Okay, you see this perfect relation with his Father. Perfect. Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophet, or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Yeah, he didn't come to do it. <clears throat> Father, Father gave, he came to fulfill it. Perfect relation with the Father. He restored relationships with God through forgiveness. Luke 7. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Okay, this is from a dinner at somebody's house, and a woman came into it. It must have been a rather public area. A woman came in, and everybody knew that this says that she was a sinner. So it's, it's commonly assumed uh, she's a, that she was had been a prostitute or something, some, something that was very well known. Uh, but she had apparently heard Jesus teaching and preaching and felt the forgiveness of God and came up to him and was, was like washing his feet and, and showing respect. And Jesus says to her, your sins are forgiven. Your faith is saved. Um, so he came to restore. This is this whole point about, you know, God forgives sin. God forgives sin so that the relationship is restored. That's what he's doing. And then creation restored in him. Diseases were healed, the dead raised, creation perfectly cooperated with him in the miracles that he performed. Let's see. At the very time Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Okay. So, so you see in the Gospels, in the life of Jesus, him performing these miracles, healing people, curing people, calming the storm, you know, those types of things. So really what's going on here is he is giving a preview of the new creation. The new creation and the perfect restored creation. Like Jesus is a is a walking, talking new creation. In the new creation, there's no disease. So he heals people. In the new creation, there's no death. He raises the dead. In the new creation, nature doesn't try to kill people. He calls them the storm. He is, he is like showing a snapshot, a preview of, of what God's intent is, what God values. And it's a picture of a restored relationship with creation. Even the point of like turning the water into wine, things like that, like creation is perfectly restored. So, so what did Jesus do to save us? He lived. He lived and lived a life demonstrating those perfect relationships. Well, what else did he do? He died. Died. If you're hearing music in the background, the choir is pretty nice. Yeah. 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 And there's probably something going on somewhere else. I, I, I don't know what all goes on here. Okay, Jesus died. He took our sins from us and gave his righteousness to us. Okay? You think about it in terms of one way the Bible does talk about sin is kind of being a debt. So it's kind of like thinking of Jesus taking your debt away and then making it have to deposit in your bank account. Okay? 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Okay. He made him, Jesus, who had no sin to be sin. He took his, our sin on himself so that it never become the righteous man. Okay. Jesus received the, the punishment, the consequence that we would have received for our sins. 
It is really forgiveness has a cost. You know, for instance, if 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 um, you know, if somebody you know, if, if I I'm going to pick on Tracy because I know she wouldn't do this, but but Tracy stole uh, my car. She stole stole my ten bucks from me, and then I said, well. Okay, Tracy, I forgive you. I paid the cost. I paid ten dollars. Okay. There's a cost to forgiveness. Jesus paid it. That's what this is about. He paid it. He received what we would have deserved. All that uh, God is a God of justice. And so all of our faults, all of our failures, there's a, there's a consequence. And what Jesus did is step in to hate. Isaiah 53, 5. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Okay, that's just a little snippet from an amazing chapter, Isaiah 53, written about 700 years before Christ, um, in which it's describing the suffering servant, is what it's called, and it's, it's almost like it's, it's Isaiah sitting there watching the cross down uh, and, and describing um, this Jesus taking, taking our place. So he offered himself as a sacrifice of atonement. Atonement means to bring peace. So 1 John 2 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Okay. Now, read Romans 3, 21, 28. I'm not going to do that right now in the interest of time. I'm going to try to really take to this. I'll stop it one time. One time. Because I'm expecting everybody's time. Um, but I would encourage you to read that. Review it. Romans 3, 20. It's going to sound a little thick. Um, Paul is a, um, a little difficult. Difficult read right reading, but digging into it. He has redeemed us. By his death. Redeem means to purchase back. These are all different metaphors or different images of describing what happened on the cross. Taking away punishment, bringing atonement, which is bring, fixing the relationship, redeeming, purchasing back. Okay. Then 1 Peter 1. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed. From the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Okay. Redeemed. That word is often used in the Old Testament, uh, I think I'll read Sunday about slavery. Uh, when you per the price to release somebody from slavery, you redeem them. Okay, so he died. Well, one more thing he did. He rose from the dead. He lived, he died, he rose from the dead. The resurrection shows that the fall, that's the Adam and Eve and the fruit, it shows that the fall is reversed in him. Reversed. Jesus, picture it this way. Jesus died for all of the, the brokenness in the world. He's dead. Okay, so in him it's gone. And then Easter morning he bursts out of the tomb, showing what happens when it's all taken away. Life happens. And uh, I am going to bring extra bundles next time. You bring one of your own or use your app so you can get some of these other verses. Um, I'm going to read from Romans 5. But the gift is not like the trespass. For the many died by the trespass of the one man. That's Adam and Eve. How much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin in the garden and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses 
and brought justification. That's a Roman legal word that means acquitted. There it is. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness and life reign through one man? So what Paul's getting at there is in Adam, it's all messed up. In Jesus, it's all fixed. Okay. All right. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, 2. Well, wait, wait, excuse me. Okay. His resurrection is the promise of our resurrection. Okay. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. New creation. So see then, well, in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own true turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Okay. There's a difference. In Adam, in the, that initial sin, it's like the team was declared outside, the whole team. Okay. Christ brings life for all, but there's a way to receive it, which we're going to get to. Okay. So, his resurrection is the promise of our resurrection. Okay, one more thing his resurrection is the preview. Of the restoration of all creation. What we see in Jesus on Easter morning is for all creation. All creation. Romans 8. The creation waits in eager expectations for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Okay. It's been, as Paul's writing to be a little, little thick, um, but he's talking about all creation is awaiting liberation, is awaiting redemption. That's the resurrection. Yeah, yeah. So you've got to think of Jesus and the resurrection as being a piece of the new creation that came ahead of time. Like the new creation comes in fullness when Christ reappears and there's the resurrection of everybody. But it's like a piece of that end time when a perfect relationship, a piece of the came on. And that's the resurrection. Now I didn't have to compare it to... Uh, don't take the off too far, okay? Mm -hmm. But it's like the Terminator, you know? Mm -hmm. the Terminator, you know, who's an agent from the future coming back to change the past. Jesus, Arnold is not Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, like Terminator, come back in time. He is an agent of a new creation who's gone back in time for them to make the present time better. Now, Terminator came back to. <laughs> so don't take it too far. <laughs> Alright. So, restored for better. Okay? We have been restored to make things better. We were designed for good, but then damaged by evil, and now we're restored to make things better. So now we have in Jesus a better relationship. A better relationship with God. Romans 8, 1 and 2. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Okay, very good. No condemnation. If you are in Christ and have a relationship with Him, you do not need to be in fear that God is not to get you. He's not. His condemnation fell on Jesus. So it doesn't fall on you. There's no condemnation. We are called to live in that. And we're called to a better relationship with people. 
Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Okay, we've been forgiven by God, and Paul says that is to lead us to forgive others. And as we forgive others and live in forgiveness of others, then we are restoring. And then all of creation. I'm not going to read that passage right now, but it's just that it's making the point that Christ came for all creation. Okay. So that's how this redemption, that's the good news. Okay? God created everything to be perfect, damaged by evil, but Jesus came, lived, died, and rose again. That is the solution. That is why. That is why what Christianity is about. That's why you walk into a sanctuary as a big cross. Because the cross is where it, it, it happened. Uh, where the, the problem in the world, the problem in the world, death and evil, is dealt with eternally. So, but that's not the end of the story. Christianity and what Jesus is about, once again, it's not just, he died, so I go to heaven. We're still here. And we have a life to live. And what Jesus was about is about this life now as well. So, let's look at it. Set together the heal. His mission is still to restore all relationships. I think I'm going to read this passage. Because I'm quoting it twice. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. Our time's been short. Okay. Read that passage. Okay. God's, from the time, when we hear me talk about the mission of God, the mission of God. From the time of the fall, and things got wrecked in the garden, God has had a mission. God's mission is to restore everything. Now, he did it in a way that might look a little odd. You know, waiting a long time, in seven years. And then we have essentially what Jesus did, but it's not fully fulfilled until he returns. Um, but I'm not God. Um, he knows what he's doing. And his plan has always been to do what he, he does and to carry out his mission through people. We didn't read the whole section from Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And I would encourage you to read Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Where when God is speaking to the, to the serpent, who is Satan, and he says that the offspring of the woman will crush your head. Um, that this is going to be fixed through her. And so God is, is saying, the old, I'm going to restore my creation, I'm going to make it right, I'm going to make a new creation, but I'm not going to do it myself, just myself. I'm going to do it through my people. Now you could look at what God sent to the people, but well, you got us in this place, so you're going to get us out. Not that we are finding light in heaven, but he's going to do it through us. And so Jesus is born to his family, that, you know, starting with Eve and then you know, with Mary. And we see all through the story of the Bible, God working through people. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and, and Solomon. And then in the New Testament, the apostles, and Peter, and Paul, and all, all those people. You know, God chooses an intention to work through people. And, and that's why his plan sometimes seems to go in strange directions because those people still all have a sinful nature. And they still need, they need the redemption. And so they don't always do things right. And we are that way as well. God still carries out his mission through us. He made his followers his partners in his mission. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5. I think we have to do All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God has reconciled the world to himself in Christ, not trying men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. 
We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, and though, and though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. You see how Paul's presenting himself? We're God's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. He's committed that to us. So, uh, you know, God is committed to only doing this mission work through you. And that means to anyone who comes to be a Christian. So, he sends his followers to make disciples of all nations. That is, making disciples means restoring the relationship with God. You can catch the last 15 minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gives us by grace 
this salvation. It's not to be pictured as he just goes around handing out a hand. You see in the Gospels, what does he do? He says, come follow me. Okay, follow me. But in the relationship with me, you have the grace, you have the gift. But what I want from you, he says, follow me. I want you to be part of sharing that. I want you to have my life. And so bring the blessings of the new creation ahead of time into the world. Uh, so uh, we, we seek to live like him and become the, the good of the new creation that we want to see. So Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Okay. That's what the Holy Spirit works in us. It's called fruit of the Spirit. I like that. Um, that means, you know, fruit. We live in place of depends on fruit, right? Uh, it's something that pro is produced by the plant. Uh, so the Holy Spirit produces that fruit. And we seek, okay, so we seek to heal our relationship with God, healing our relationship with each other. We seek to heal relationships our own and with others. We ask for forgiveness and forgive others. So as Christians, a really key part of being a Christian is taking that forgiveness we have from God and living it with others. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about the Lord's Prayer. Uh, but here's one part of the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 12. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Okay, or the version that we often use in worship here, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. And Jesus put right in the middle of that prayer, tying together the forgiveness we receive with the forgiveness we give. See, it's not just to receive the gift, but then to live the gift. It's such a huge part in Jesus' view of living out being a Christian is living in forgiveness with other people. Matthew 18, 21, 25 talks about that. Um, we're not going to look at those now, but uh, those are good verses about it. So healing our relationship with God, healing our relationship with each other, and then healing in the world. This healing will only be complete in eternity. We're not going to fix the world. Just as we can't fix ourselves spiritually and stop sinning. Just as we cannot make relationships with other people perfect. It's not going to happen. So we can't totally fix the world either. But we strive for it anyhow. As much as we can. You know, until the work is all going to happen in eternity. Until then, we are called to, among other things, protect the human environment, fight injustice and oppression. You know, it's like we see things that God has promised in the new creation, and we try to bring them about now. Not that we're going to achieve it, but we do it because what we see as God promising the new creation, we know that's the heart of God. You know, God is God of justice. The new creation is perfect justice, so I look for justice now. You know, God has uh, got a perfect relationship, so I work towards relationships now. Uh, so that, that is the foundation of, of our ethic. We're not trying to climb the ladder of heaven. We're not trying to earn by our behavior and by our ethic. No, we already have it. We've been given a new creation. But we are want to live that new creation in how we act in it, how we share with others. Make sense? Okay. Now, that's grace. All we've talked about. We've talked about the fall. we talked about what Jesus did. Living, dying, rising again. Giving it to us by grace. Calling us by grace. When we receive it, we're saved by grace. What does that, through faith, what does that mean? Well, faith is more than head knowledge. Faith is more than intellectual cognition. James 2.19. We'll go around and read it. You believe that there is one God. Good. You and the demons believe that and shudder. Okay. James is saying, hey, you know, even demons acknowledge that God exists. Faith is not just acknowledging that there is a God. That is not saying faith. So I said, oh, I don't believe there's a God. Well, okay. The devil believes that too. Okay. Um, faith is something <clears throat> rich. It has to do with receiving 
God's gift, grabbing on to God's gift, relying on God. So it's a little, little picture there. The gift of God to me is through faith. Faith is how it comes to me. Uh, John 3.16, those famous verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Okay, there it is again. Uh, it is receiving God. Faith is receiving God. John 1.12. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Okay, it's receiving righteousness. A state of being innocent before God. That is a right relationship with God. Okay. Here we go. The top passage from Romans 3. But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known. The righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all who have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Okay. So all is the righteousness from God. It's not something that we're generating. It's a gift by grace. And it comes through faith. Faith is trust. Faith is grabbing on to. Okay. Uh, well, there's an illustration. Um, a, um, supposedly a true story. I think the guy's name was Blonde. And he was a famous tightrope walker. You know, maybe 100 years ago or so. And he... he Struggles were up all over the place. He did daring things, and one of them was across the Niagara Falls and walked across the Niagara Falls. And uh, my cross came back. And he asked the crowd there, How many believe that I can do that? Tiger up walk across the falls carrying somebody on my back. And lots of hands went up. And then he said, Who volunteers? <laughs> hands went down. That's the difference between petty knowledge and faith. Faith is climbing on its back. Okay? So, uh, we say we receive through faith. It's saying, Jesus, you're my God. You're my Lord. I am trusting you. I want to follow you. I want to live this new creation life. You're mine. So, faith is the restored relationship with God. Faith, that is the relationship God wants to have. It's taking the hand, reach down to us, and saying yes to God's desire to lift us up. Faith is trust. Okay, Romans 5. Tracy. Okay, therefore, since we have been justified through If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? That's trusting in him. So faith brings all the blessings of the restored relationship with God. Faith brings forgiveness, eternal life, the Holy Spirit, peace with God. It's not about religion, which is the series of things to do to climb the ladder, but a relationship it's not about information, but transformation. It's not about achieving, but receiving. It's not about do, it's about done. Okay? So, you know, how's your relationship with God? Just some things to think about. Do you have a faith relationship with the Savior? Or to put it in terms of the question asked Paul in the Bible, what must I do to be saved? Acts 16, 30-31. What must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. In John 5, 24. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my words and believes has crossed over from death to life. So you don't do anything. All you do is receive. God has already done what is necessary. That's why it's called grace. Jesus died on the cross and rose again for the forgiveness of sins. Do you believe that is true for you? And trust me, that is the question. If you answer yes, then you are saved. Your sins are forgiven, your life is redeemed, your relationship with God is restored, your name is received, your name is received into the family of God.
Give to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Next page is just a summary of what we talked about tonight. Okay, just one quick review. Okay, just say if you want to practice uh, sharing that with somebody. Oh, there, take your children. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, see how, how well it's uh, it's been sunk in. Okay, the next page, and I can go over now because we're almost out of time. Um, but uh, this is just uh, these are what we call marks of discipleship. What it means to follow Jesus. Jesus' follower will be constant in prayer, grounded in the Word, faithful in worship, spiritual, developing spiritual friendships, loving service, intentionally generous, and compassionate witness. We'll be talking about all those later on. And then I have a book for you. Merry Christmas.